Okay, good evening, everyone, and Ramadan Kareem. Um, I'm really happy you guys are all joining me tonight, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to go over this lecture of multiple sclerosis and immune-mediated diseases by Dr. Nkawi. Um, the lecture, as you may know, is about like an hour and 45 minutes. So my attempt is to kind of reduce that by at least 50%, make it much shorter, and hopefully twice the amount of benefit, inshallah. So if you guys have any questions, we'll stop here and there. There'll be a little stop sign on the screen that you guys can see, and then that will be our indication that we'll stop and take questions. Um, throughout, though, I would love it if you guys participated with me. Um, I have a couple questions here and there at MCQ, so you guys can unmute yourselves and speak, um, and we can make this more of an interactive session. Um, and the last thing I want to say before we start is that this is a clinical lecture, so I know that you've received your pharmacology lectures and your pathology lectures kind of related to um, neurodegenerative and demyelinating diseases, so this is mostly going to focus on the clinical aspects of everything, um, kind of just like the management, the diagnostics, um, interventions that we do and the clinical picture and kind of how to relate everything that you've taken from pathophysiology and things like that into a clinical picture. So if you get a clinical um, case on the exam, you're able to answer that correctly. Um, another thing is multiple sclerosis is a very high yield topic, especially for SAQs. They love testing multiple sclerosis. Um, and that's just because it covers your pharmacology. It covers pathophysiology, um, microbiology, like literally everything except for like anatomy and they even cover immunology. So like, it's a very, very high yield topic. It's important to know it. And again, we're just going to be looking at the clinical features of it today, but obviously study it well in terms of um, all the other disciplines. And lastly, we're also going to be looking at Guillain-Barre syndrome and a few other diseases that I'll discuss soon. But for the most part, our focus is on MS. So let's get started. We're going to start with a question. So would any of you guys like to read it? just so we can be more interactive. Um, a 36-year-old woman comes to the physician for intermittent stabbing face pain. The pain typically occurs in waves of several individual episodes lasting about one second. It is bilateral, but rarely occurs on both sides simultaneously. Touching her face or brushing her teeth can trigger an attack. Four months ago, she had an episode of weakness in her right arm that lasted a week. Family history is notable for migraines headaches in her mother and brother. Vital signs are within normal limits. There is decreased sensation in the V2 and V3 distribution of the trigeminal nerve bilaterally. Muscle strength is three out of five in the upper left upper, left upper extremity and five out of five in the right upper extremity. There's spasticity in the lower extremities with sustained clonus. Further evaluation is most likely to show which of the following. Okay, so the answer options are A, enhancing lesion in the internal auditory canal, B, jaw claudication and unilateral vision loss, C, multiple periventricular sclerotic plaques, D, arrhythmatis papules, E, photophobia, and F, rhinorrhea, lacrimation, and ptosis. As of right now, what are you guys thinking could be the answer? I'm not sure if the chat is open. I can't really see it right now, but... If it is, go ahead and just kind of unmute yourselves if you guys have any um, ideas. I'll give you guys a second, though. Okay. I'll try to see the chat. Let me see. Okay, I have it open. All right, so there's nothing in the chat right now. That's fine. So um, the answer for this is multiple periventricular sclerotic plaques. And we're going to get more into this, obviously, within the lecture. But this is an example of MS, okay, multiple sclerosis. And these plaques, you would see them on MRI. So in Dr. Nkawi's lecture, he talked about demyelinating disorders of um, the CNS and demyelinating disorders of the PNS, so peripheral nervous system and central nervous system. As you guys probably already know, the central nervous system is myelinated by oligodendrocytes and the peripheral nervous system is myelinated by Schwann cells. Myelin, as you already know, is basically little wrapping of membranes that we put around these axons in order for them to increase their saltatory conduction. 
And demyelination is basically when that process is interrupted, when those oligodendrocytes and those Schwann cells can't myelinate properly. And so then you see a lot of these like neurological changes um, inside of the patient's presentation. So for your demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system, he put a lot of different um, classes on the slide as well as for demyelinating disorders of the peripheral nervous system. But the only ones that he focused on in his lecture was under the inflammatory category. So we have multiple sclerosis, which is the most important one. Um, and then we also have PML. And then for the peripheral nervous system, the only one you need to know is Gillian Barr. So although this slide that you might've seen on his lecture is like a lot, there's only three things that you really need to know from it. So we're gonna focus on those and we're gonna start with multiple sclerosis. Um, pretty important topic, tested on MCQs, SAQs, and basically a chronic progressive autoimmune condition affecting the central nervous system um, and demyelination um, affecting the oligodendrocytes. So we're gonna get into the epidemiology first. Um, most important thing, the most important picture to have in mind before I, I you know, alliterate any of these is a young woman a Scandinavian descent or European descent um, and high socioeconomic status and basically age of onset 20 to 40 years. So it's, it's more common in the white population and people who live further away from the equator. Um, the actual cause of multiple sclerosis is unknown, but it comes from a mix of genetic and environmental factors. So the genetic factors being female, having the gene that codes for HLA-DR2, um, and environmental factors like infections, quite famously, you have the Epstein-Barr virus infection, vitamin D deficiency, which is an interesting one because it might explain why multiple sclerosis rates are higher in the northern and southern poles away from the equator, uh, where there's more sunlight in the equator, so there's less sunlight over there. And all of these factors contribute to the development of the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction that causes immune cells to create autoantibodies in multiple sclerosis that attack these oligodendrocytes, which are responsible for creating myelin sheets in the central nervous system. So the clinical course looks a little bit like this. There are basically four main types of multiple sclerosis, and they're determined based on the pattern of symptoms over time. So if we were to draw this out, we would have um, on the x-axis, we would say this is our time, okay? and Sorry, that's like the worst tea ever, but that's our time, okay? And that's basically like the patient's lifespan. And then here on the y-axis, I'm gonna put disability. This is like the progression of symptoms. So in the four different types, we have the first one, which is the most common one. I'm gonna put it in red, relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. So you have bouts of autoimmune attacks that happen about a month or a year apart. So that is your autoimmune attack, followed by some improvement in symptoms, for example, someone might lose vision and then it improves due to remyelination. However, more often than that, remyelination isn't complete. So there's some residual disability, which is why you see it still going up. And um, we basically have this pattern of relapsing and remitting, but slowly getting worse. So basically, you have these autoimmune attacks, which are happening, and they're happening a few months or years apart in terms of your time. And then with, which, with each relapse, you're also having some remitting time, which is improving, but then getting worse, improving a little bit, getting worse. So I'm going to title that your relapsing and remitting uh, multiple sclerosis. Again, this is the most common type. All right. And then your second one is primary progressive. And your primary progressive is literally just you're con like continuously progressing and there's not really any attacks or anything. Um, one constant attack on myelin basically is how you can describe it. And it causes a steady progression of disability over a person's uh, lifetime. So we're going to label that as primary progressive, multiple sclerosis, very different from re the relapsing and remitting version. Um, the next one, your third one, is called secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So initially, it's pretty similar to your relapsing and remitting, but over time, it becomes constant and causes a steady progression of disability. So the way that you would draw this out, your secondary progressive, it's going to be very similar, like I said, to your relapsing and remitting. But then eventually, we're not going to have these relapsing and remitting episodes anymore, and it's just going to become similar to your primary progressive. So this blue one is then going to be your secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And then let me try to find another color. 
Your final one that we're going to talk about is progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis. It's the same as primary progressive, except bouts of attacks are superimposed, meaning the progression happens even faster. So with each attack of progressive relapsing, you significantly get worse. So it's very similar to your uh, primary progressive where it's a continuous straight line going up, but within those straight lines, you have these superimposed kind of uh, relapses. And then from that, you can expect it to get worse. So then that's gonna be titled as your progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis. So all of this can be a little bit confusing, but in Dr. Nkawi's slide, um, you can see them all over here. So the relapsing and remitting is the one that we did in red. So again, um, bouts of autoimmune attacks happening months or years apart, followed by some improvements for some time. Um, and then remyelination is not complete usually. So that's what's explained here. Sometimes remyelination would be complete. Sometimes it's not. And then it improves. However, more often than not, remyelination is not complete. Residual disability is there. Um, and overall, the CNS is getting more and more damaged. Primary progressive, again, we'll look back over here. That's the one we did in purple. Constantly just getting worse. Secondary progressive, again, over here in blue. That's where you have a little bit of... Um, a cons sorry, yeah, a little bit of similarity to the relapsing and remitting, but then eventually it becomes very similar to primary progressive. And then progressive relapsing is the one that we did in pink over here. And that's the one where, again, very similar to primary progressive, except with every new attack, it gets worse. So those are the four different subtypes. And then moving on to the clinical features. Um, the most common clinical feature to know and the one that's probably most tested, most high yield is optic neuritis. Um, it's the most common primary symptom, primary manifestation of myasthenia or not myasthenia gravis of multiple sclerosis. Um, so basically you'll have optic neuritis is one of those. Um, other things include brainstem, cerebellar manifestations, myelopathic manifestations, sensory, cognitive, um, and autonomic nervous system manifestations. Um, basically the plaques from multiple sclerosis or being um, not deposited, but you're seeing these plaques all over your central nervous system. You're seeing them in your optic nerves. You're seeing them in your cranial nerves. You're seeing them um, widespread throughout your brain stem, your cerebellum, um, throughout spinal cortical tracts, throughout basically anywhere in your nervous system. And so then you see this like myriad of different symptoms that are happening in different places in your body, but all of them are related to this one disease. So for the eyes, you have optic neuritis. It's the most common one, as we said. Um, it's basically the inflammation of your optic nerve, um, and it presents with an acute onset blurring of vision, um, pain on eye movements, visual field defects, a loss of um, different um, colored visions, um, pain with movement, like we said, um, and especially movement upwards and downwards. And it all basically is because demyelination is happening in the optic nerve. So optic neuritis is a big one. Um, brainstem and cerebellar manifestations, you can have things like hearing impairment, diminished taste, facial weakness, all of the different cranial nerve um, palsies, cerebellar involvement, poor postural control, imbalance, gait dysfunction. Um, myelopathic manifestations would be things like having weakness, spasticity. Um, you would have intention tremors, um, and then you also have the autonomic nervous system manifestations, sexual, per, uh, sexual dysfunction, fecal urgency, constipation, um, urinary, loss of urinary control, and then cognitive dysfunction as well. So you see fatigue, you see um, depression, anxiety. So basically there's just a ton of symptoms that someone with multiple sclerosis can present with. And essentially all of it is because of the same pathophysiological mechanisms. It's just depositing those, or those plaques are just taking place in different areas. Um, one more thing before we get more into details on that is Charcot's triad. It's a common tr um, trio of neurological symptoms that you see in multiple sclerosis. So you have dysarthria, which is like difficulty or unclear speech. And that's because those plaques are being deposited in the brain stem and they're interfering with consciousness, talking or eating as well. Um, and also unconscious movements like swallowing. So again, that's like to do with the plaques um, disrupting the brainstem. 
and you have things like nystagmus, which is involuntary rapid eye movement. And that's because of the plaques being disrupted in the nerves, like the optic nerves. You have loss of vision, you have optic neuritis, like we said before. If the nerves are responsible for eye movements are affected, you can see pain and double vision. Um, and then intention tremor. So when plaques deposit along your motor pathways, it can result in muscle weakness, spasms, resulting in tremors, ataxia. So that's characteristically known as Charcot's triad, and it's not just seen in multiple sclerosis, but other neurological manif um, manifestations as well. So we're going to get into a question really quickly. So um, you don't have to read all of it, but can someone at least kind of read the first maybe three or four sentences? And then I think we should be able to get um, the overall picture. So this case is of a 33-year-old woman who comes to the physician because she has a vision impairment in her right eye for the last two weeks and she has her right eye. She has no double vision and her headaches are relieved with ibuprofen. Uh, but she recently had, a year ago, she had a similar episode with her left eye, but it resolved uh, spontaneously. Um, she can work even in poor lighting conditions and her pupils are equal, round and reactive to light and accommodation. And without correction, she has a visual acuity of 20 over 50 in the left and 20 over 100 in the right. The visual acuity is 20 or 20, 20 and in the left eye and 20 of 100 in the right eye. A slit lamp examination shows no abnormalities. A CT scan of the head shows no abnormalities. So they're asking what the most likely diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just to recap, young woman, she's coming in acute onset of difficulties seeing difficulties in different and distinguishing different colors, eye pain, um, and a little bit of a headache, few other nonspecific symptoms. Um, and we're doing a CT, we're not seeing anything alarming, there's no trauma, nothing like that. Um, so again, we're thinking, you know, young woman and acute vision impairment and inability to see different um, colors, pain with eye movement, all of those things are very similar to the first presentation that you have during multiple sclerosis, which would be, and would someone like to answer this? Okay, it'd be optic neuritis. And so that is the answer, optic neuritis. So the patient's presentation is consistent with optic neuritis, which again, is the first manifestation of multiple sclerosis. Um, again, she's right there in the perfect age gap of 20 to 40 years old. She's a female and she's presenting with, you know, she had no other past relevant medical history. And all of a sudden she's coming in with visual impairment. Again, first manifestation. Um, so best thing we do for patients like this, they come in with optic neuritis. Um, they should undergo a brain MRI to assess if there's demyelination going on because um, that could support a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So moving forward with diagnostics, with that being said, or you know what, let's, let's stop here. So I'll take a checkpoint here. So if anyone has any questions, let's go ahead and answer those now. So far, we've covered the clinical features of multiple sclerosis. We've covered the clinical course, the different types of relapsing and remitting courses. And we've talked about the general classification of demyelinating disorders. If there aren't any questions, we can move on to the diagnostics of multiple sclerosis. But I'll give you guys a minute. Okay. If there, let me actually go and check the chat clear. Okay, great. Let me actually. Keep that there so we can see. Alrighty. Okay, moving on. And we'll go to diagnostics. So this is a screenshot from your guys' slide. Uh, multiple sclerosis is typically suspected when you have multiple neurological symptoms spread over space and spread over time. And when all other differentials are negative. Basically, dissemination in time and dissemination in space refer to having, first of all, time, you have separate bouts or separate flare-ups followed by 
um, suppression. So appearance of new um, lesions in different regions of, um, sorry, I just confused myself. Um, but basically you have time and then, and then spread out through space. So time basically means that you have different flare-ups over time, relapses and remissions. That's one criteria. The other criteria is different um, dissemination throughout space, meaning that you have a myriad of symptoms. So it can happen, you know, like you have optic neuritis in your eyes, you can have a bunch of different other presentations, spastic paralysis, things like that, avoiding dysfunctions. So it just means that it's not just localized to one part of your body. It's a multi-system involvement. That's what disseminated throughout space means. It just means space within your body. Disseminated throughout time means you have flares and then remission. And then no other neurological diagnosis, it's likely to be multiple sclerosis. So these are the three things that you need. And there's something called the McDonald criteria. And um, all of these different things have to be met in order for the McDonald criteria to allow the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Um, and the way in which we test that it is in fact, a dissemination throughout time and a dissemination throughout space is by looking at imaging. Imaging would be your MRI of the brain and you'd see those sclerotic plaques and then you would do clinical findings. So like we talked about earlier here in this slide, all of these different clinical symptoms. And then the last one would be laboratory findings, which we'll get into in a second. So for imaging, you do an MRI. MRI is the mainstay for the diagnosis, diagnostic uh, imaging of multiple sclerosis. It's um, sensitive to the brain changes that occur in multiple sclerosis. So that's why we go for MRI instead of CT. Um, and characteristic MRI findings, you're going to see demyelinated sclerotic plaques primarily located in the white matter. And I'm going to show you guys a picture here. So this here on the left is supposed to be a normal brain MRI. And then on the right is a multiple sclerotic lesion plaques MS um, MRI. So you see all these little white plaques over here. It's already pointed out to on the slide. These are your characteristic pathognomic feature of multiple sclerosis. Um, here, you're also seeing these hyperintense signals. These are also indicators of multiple sclerosis. These are similar to the plaques seen in the previous image. Um, over here, periventricular demyelinating lesions, they're much bigger, but um, also very indicative of multiple sclerosis. And then you also have these little things over here, um, Dawson figures, they're called radial extensions, finger-like radial extensions, these Dawson figures over here um, coming out from the sides. These are also indicative of uh, multiple sclerosis. So the moment that you see these white plaques and you think white, you think white matter, demyelination. Um, obviously, all of this, these inflammatory processes are happening in the white matter because that's where your myelin is located. So you can expect those signals to be hyper intense, even in your spinal cord. So there's this little um, hyper intense signal over here. That's another indicator. It doesn't just have to be a brain MRI. It can also be, um, you know, a, a spinal imaging, um, and then through there, you can also make a diagnosis. So if you were to see an image like this kind of on your exam, and uh, let's say it was it was better quality and you could clearly see there's this uh, white hyper intense signal here. And let's say this was a lot more uh, radiolucent and you could see the white here. Um, it'd be very easy to just look at this image and go like, okay, this is multiple sclerosis. Same thing going on over here. You could also say multiple sclerosis just by looking at the MRI. So very easy pathognomic feature. And if they give you um, an MRI, it's just a very simple way for you to quickly make that diagnosis. Um, but they might not give you an MRI and you might have to look at other features. So here are some other features. Um, if you do a CSF examination for multiple sclerosis, you'd see something called um, oligoclonal bands. So presence in CSF of oligoclonal bland, uh, bands, but not in the blood, supports uh, multiple sclerosis diagnosis. And this is because these oligoclonal bands uh, manifest when you have an increased production of these like nonspecific immunoglobulins in the cerebrospinal fluid that have to do with um, the autoimmune process happening in multiple sclerosis. So it's basically an indic indicator that there's inflammation ongoing. Um, in the central nervous system. So you'd expect this to be higher in the CSF and you wouldn't expect it to be high in the blood because again, it's the central nervous system um, pathology. You'd also see lymphocytic pleocytosis, so high lymph, um, 
counts. And then these are different other laboratory studies you can do to rule out other diagnostics, diagnoses. Um, so if you were to go through a question like this, so I'll just go through it really quickly. 28 year old woman, increasing weakness, numbness in her legs, um, more severe after a hot shower in the morning. This is another thing, by the way, with um, multiple sclerosis, it can be exacerbated by heat. Um, all right, partial vision loss a year ago in her left eye. So we're thinking maybe um, an ocular manifestation and deep tendon reflexes, plantar reflex, sensor response bilaterally, everything else is okay, MRI of the brain and spine is inconclusive. Um, but we're still thinking if this was to be um, MS and it wasn't to be shown yet, maybe on the MRI and maybe don't see those sclerotic lesions quite yet, you would still see something like this. So an illegal clonal bands in the CSF, like we said earlier. So they might not give you the MRI um, and they might not tell you that, okay, we see these lesions, but another way to diagnose um, MS is to have these illegal clonal bands in the CSF alongside with their absence in the blood. And again, this just means an inflammatory process is happening in the cerebrospinal fluid in the um, central nervous system. So that is another thing and you would see that on lumbar puncture. So that's it for diagnostics. Moving on to the prognosis, management, and prevention. Prognosis, uh, multiple sclerosis itself, rarely is never really going to be the cause of direct death, but there are other complications that may arise. And obviously, you can think if you're affecting all these other organ systems, you know, at some point, one of them um, may be so severely affected that it significantly increases your morbidity. Um, one thing, especially if it is going to affect your respiratory system and you have respiratory system depression, obviously that greatly impacts your morbidity. So um, rarely fatal, but it does decrease your average life expectancy to by, by about five to 10 years. Um, poor prognostic factors um, by being male, um, age of onset being older than 40 years old, having multiple systems being involved incomplete recovery after exacerbations and a high relapse rate. So currently there's no cure for multiple sclerosis, but there are medications um, that are targeted towards decreasing the frequency and severity of relapses. So you have disease modifying agents, you have different things like uh, natalizumab, interferons, like beta interferons, um, Vladimir, acetate, different things that you probably will learn more about in your pharmacology lectures. And the acute management for multiple sclerosis flare-ups. So again, this is like a long-term management um, just in general to keep the disease at bay. But during the event of a flare-up, IV, uh, IV glucocorticoids are what, are, uh, what is given. And if the patient doesn't respond to IV glucoc glucocorticoids, then you give plasmapheresis. So first line management, glucocorticoids, high dose, and second line plasmapheresis. So we're gonna just really quickly test that in a question, for example, 27 year old woman, perfect age, perfect gender for us to start thinking about multiple sclerosis, progressive numbness, weakness in her left arm and left leg, urinary urgency and incontinence, again, myriad of symptoms, blurry vision, Diffi uh, difficulty distinguishing colors, headache, acute onset of all of these things. Um, upon flexion of the neck, patient experiences a shooting electric sensation that travels down the spine. This is also alongside with um, the heat intolerance. This is also another characteristic thing of multiple sclerosis, um, that when you flex the neck, you feel this electric shock kind of going down. So if you, hear, if you hear anything like that or heat intolerance, it's also another indicator of multiple sclerosis. Um, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? So she's coming in with an acute flare-up of her multiple sclerosis. And like we said, the first line treatment for acute flare-up is IV glucocorticoid. So from here, the best answer would probably be IV methylprednisone, first line treatment. After that, if that doesn't work, then you would go on to plasmapheresis. Other things like interferon beta therapy, again, it's, it's, it's a disease modifying agent and it's something that's given on the daily and it's not given during acute episodes. 
Okay. Now, lastly, um, prevention of multiple sclerosis. You have these modifiable agents. Obviously, you have things that you can't modify, but modifiable risk factors. Um, vitamin D deficiency, um, treat it. Obesity, smoking, these are things that just kind of go with every um, autoimmune disease prevention. Uh, previous infections with Epstein-Barr virus. There's no vaccine for Epstein-Barr virus, but to just prevent that virus, because that virus, again, is, is linked to the epidemiology and etiology of um, multiple sclerosis, like we saw here. So just kind of looking at which of these risk factors are modifiable. Obviously, a lot of them are not modifiable, like your Scandinavian descent, certain genetics, being a woman, things like that. So those are the modifiable risk factors. All right, we're going to stop one more time. And if there are any questions, I'll take them now. So I'm looking at the chat box. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so one of my friends sent me this. Um, I think it's like from your guys' like group chat, apparently in your neuro SAQ. Um, you're expecting demyelinating diseases, things like multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barr syndrome. So with that being said, I'm going to give you guys a case, and I want you to treat it like an SAQ. Um, ideally, if they gave you a case, this is something what it would like it would look like, and then they would ask you questions like this on your SAQ. They would ask you for the diagnosis, which obviously you can already assess from now is going to be multiple sclerosis, but then briefly describe the case kind of like talk about the pathophysiology, um, the definition, things like that in, in two and three. Um, and then you'd have to be able to tell what are your MRI and CSF findings, right? And then the prognosis and what, of, what is one of the most common causes of death in this case. So if you guys want to, um, why don't you guys tell me if you want to in the chat, you guys can answer it in the chat. You can unmute and answer it. Or if you guys just want to take a screenshot and maybe answer it later, that's fine too. And we can continue um, with the lecture and talk about the other diseases. But I just kind of wanted to give you like an SAQ case. How would you explain the pathogenesis? Okay, so honestly, the pathogenesis would be explained best by looking at your pathology lectures. But ideally, I think you would just talk about the B cells and the T cells. I know there's something to do with the blood brain barrier increasing in like the amount of B cells that lets in. So just talk about whatever you're taught from your, um, your pathology lecture and put that for um, that part of the question. Um, first line therapy for the um, acute flare up is going to be IV glucocorticoids. Second line will be plasmapheresis. Um, but actual management is more so like your disease modifying agents and uh, monoclonal antibodies. Um, there are some that were written over here on the clinical lecture. Um, they were quite random, so I think it's definitely better to refer to your pharmacology lectures for this um, because that could also be part of the SAQ as well. They could ask you for the management. And yeah. Okay. So yeah, just like really quickly, we can go through this. So multiple sclerosis would be the diagnosis. You would just kind of explain what multiple sclerosis is. Okay, it's a demyelinating chronic progressive disorder um, and it's caused by, and then you would move on to your pathogenesis and explain that. Um, MRI and CSF findings. So on MRI, you would see the sclerotic plaques and you would explain where they would be found. Um, and your CSF, oligoclonal antibodies. Um, and then prognosis of the disease, like we discussed, it's not necessarily like, a fatal disease, that there are certain prognostic factors that can make it better or worse. And one of the most common causes of death in this case, I actually have to read up on that and, and find out. Um, if someone actually wants to go ahead and Google that, they can do that. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I want to say respiratory distress, but not entirely sure. So we can go back to that. But for example, that might be something that they ask you. Okay. If there are no more questions for multiple sclerosis, we're gonna move on to two more diseases before we finish up. 
The next two diseases are going to be progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and Guillain Barr syndrome. So, okay, we'll get into those now. So, really quickly, just to kind of give you guys a little recap, we talked about PML over here. It's another central nervous system demyelinating disorder right there. And then your peripheral nervous system demyelinating disorder that we're going to talk about is Guillain Barr syndrome. So we're just going to talk about these very briefly because he was, Dr. Elkawi was very brief in his discussion of these two. Um, so for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, it's a demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. And basically it's caused by reactivation of this virus called JC virus. Okay. It occurs mainly in patients with severe immunosuppression like HIV and AIDS and clinical manifestations are going to include focal neurological deficits, seizures, visual changes, and your diagnosis is going to be made on typical imaging findings, but brain biopsy would be the gold standard of diagnosis for PML. And your treatment is going to be mainly supportive, um, but in patients that are immunocompromised, they have HIV, they have um, AIDS, you should start um, with um, in, an antiretroviral therapy to really manage the disease. So the reason why it's important here for us is, again, we're talking about immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive agents, immunomodulators, disease-modifying agents. These are different types of drugs that people with multiple sclerosis would be on because obviously if you have an autoimmune disease, you want to give yourself immunosuppressors so that it's not going out of balance. And so when you are immunosuppressed, you're more likely to have these types of infections and viruses. So this reactivation of this JC virus that happens in PML is a risk factor um, for, or multiple sclerosis is a risk factor for this type of um, disease. So that's why it's relevant and it's you know, very similar to multiple sclerosis in that it is a demyelination disorder. So that's why it's important to kind of um, be aware of, but just think about like if multiple sclerosis patient is on multiple sclerosis treatment, this is something that might happen. So we get into um, this question. A 38 year old woman comes to the physician for a follow up exam. Two years ago, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She's had four exacerbations over the past six months. So already when you think about that, you're like, okay, she was diagnosed with this and she's had this for a while. She probably is on those long-term immunosuppressive agents and she's probably being treated with glucocorticoids during her acute flare-ups, right? So again, they confirm it, interferon beta, multivitamin, methylprednisone. So she's taking those disease-modifying agents um, and she is immunosuppressed because of her treatment for multiple sclerosis. Um, patient is anxious about the number of exacerbations, repeated hospitalizations. She agrees to start treatment with natalizumab, uh, which is a monoclonal antibody, is concerned with potential adverse side effects. If treated with this um, monoclonal antibody, this patient is at risk for which of the following? And the answer here would be PML, because treatment with this, again, like I said before, is going to increase the risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, and it can cause reactivation of JC virus. Again, I'm just going to write it out like this. It, it's literally just like letters J and C. Um, so if she was affected with JC virus a while ago, um, once her immune system goes down, it can, it can reappear, kind of like herpes, things like that. Um, and it would cause demyelination, um, just go here so you guys can see the answer. It would cause demyelination of the central nervous system um, and it can be potentially fatal. Um, and so for a patient like this, if they do have JC virus and they are on, um, taking these medications for MS, um, they really shouldn't continue with it. Um, if they do, they'll see um, things like seizures, focal neurological deficits, um, hemianopsia, and my <laughs> taking her inhaler on the floor next to me. Um, but yeah, seizures, hemianopsia, different things like that. And you have PML, I'm so sorry. Okay. Moving on, we have GBS. Okay, so can we see are there any questions? Yeah, Google says pulmonary complications, the most common cause of death. Yeah, 
most common cause of death for multiple sclerosis pulmonary complications. Makes sense. Okay, finally, we're going to talk about um, Gillian Barr syndrome. So, Gillian Barr syndrome, it's, it's a little different from PML. PML is like your, your immunity goes down, and then the virus that you already had is going to show up, and then that is going to cause demyelination and it's going to cause more symptoms for someone with MS. This is a little bit different. Gillian Barr is a bit different because it's acute post infectious polyneuropathy. So it's like you have this other infection. It's not as related to multiple sclerosis when we talk about it in a clinical context. Um, you have some kind of infection. Um, these are the different types of infectious agents, Campylobacter, um, different types of viruses, mycoplasma, um, and it's going to cause very characteristically ascending paralysis. Um, so basically, it can be described as an acute post-infectious polyneuropathy characterized by symmetric and ascending flaccid paralysis. In affected patients, autoantibodies are going to be attacking the antigens on axons and causing demyelination. Um, and you're going to have ascending paralysis, areflexia, and all of this is going to be in the peripheral nervous system. So it's going to be affecting Schwann cells. Again, we're going to look back at the slide. That's what we're seeing over here, gillian Barr syndrome. So it's affecting ax, um, the axons in the peripheral nervous system. And so one thing that's really important to notice here is the hallmark for gillian Barr syndrome is something called albuminocytologic dissociation. I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but it's, it's written over here. I'm going to highlight it. So albuminocytologic dissociation, it's basically an elevation in your CSF protein levels without an associated elevation in your white blood cells. So I'm going to say that again, elevation and CSF protein levels without an elevation in your white blood cells. This is your hallmark finding for Guillain-Barr syndrome. So you can get confused and mixed up with any other syndromes, any other diseases, any other demyelination things. But once you hear albuminocytologic dissociation and you know that there is an elevation in CSF proteins, immediately you're thinking Gillian Barr. And this is just because there's an inflammation in your CSF proteins because of the widespread inflammation in, in your nerve roots. So yeah. And the different types of infections that can lead to Guillain-Barr syndrome are going to be Campylobacter, different viruses, not just the, the ones listed on the side. You can have HIV, influenza, um, Epstein-Barr virus, of course, um, and mycoplasma pneumonia as well. So all of these different things are, are called something called antecedent infection. Antecedent infection basically is, is a specific name given to infections that lead to GBS. So antecedent is not a word that's used for anything else other than GBS. So you hear that word as well, you're thinking Gillian Barr. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to do this question. Would someone like to read it? Okay, that's fine. I can read it. So someone has a stomach flu. About two to three weeks after developing the first signs of the stomach flu, he develops tingling and numbness in his legs and arms. Given this information, this person most likely is showing signs of blank. And answers in the chat box. So yeah, the correct answer is Gillian Barr. And the answer, the question should have said numbness in his legs moving up to his arms so that you know it's ascending paralysis. Um, but either way, they mentioned legs before they mentioned arms. You easily have that. You easily know it's Gillian Barr. All righty. So I will take any other questions that you guys have now. I believe that was our last slide. So if there aren't any questions, I just want to say thank you for attending this session with me. Good luck. You guys got this. If you guys need anything, you can always text me here or email me, but go ahead and text me because I'll be a lot quicker to respond there. And I hope this session was somewhat beneficial for you guys. Multiple sclerosis is a very high yield topic. Um, they love testing it in SAQs. Um, definitely you're going to see a few MCQs on it as well.
um, especially looking at these like images, things like that. Um, it just, it's a topic that can be tested amongst various disciplines and it definitely will be tested for that reason. So just kind of be aware of the most high yield things. You have optic neuritis, that's the first thing that um, appears as a symptom in these types of um, presentations. So you see a woman coming in with optic neuritis, um, any visual disturbances all of a sudden, and she's of, you know, 20 years to 40 years old, female, especially if she's a white woman, um, you're automatically thinking multiple sclerosis. Um, other things that are high yield, again, just looking at the MRI findings, you should be able to look at an MRI of the brain, MRI of the spinal cord, and be able to see those sclerotic plaques and know, okay, this is multiple sclerosis. Um, management, I'm not really entirely sure how much you're going to test you on management. It does also have a lot to do with your pharmacology lectures. So look into the disease modifying um, things in your pharmacology lecture if you have those. Um, but for acute management, very easily, you know, it's IV glucocorticoids as the first line treatment. Um, and just be prepared to write an SAQ and, you know, a very long one on um, multiple sclerosis and get a lot of points from that. And then other things are other demyelinating disorders. They're, they're not very high yield, but they're, they're kept um, in the lecture for the sake of completion, um, just so everything is covered from your clinical lecture. Um, but you can go through this kind of and just say, okay, this is related to multiple sclerosis because of PML, JC. Okay, she's on medication for multiple sclerosis. Um, you can expect progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And Gillian Barr is, is kind of a very different topic. And I think it is tested a little bit more in other disciplines like your physiology and things like that, um, more than it would be tested clinically. Um, but clinically, if you do see a patient coming in, ascending paralysis, automatically, you know, Gillian Barr. All of these things are, are demyelination disorders. And yeah, with that being said, um, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sun. I was drowning and you resuscitated me back to life. You're welcome. Yeah, with that being said, that's it. Thank you guys for coming and Ramadan Kareem to everyone. And thank you for all your nice comments in the chat. They're really sweet. And um, yeah, um, I think we can end the voice, not the voice note, sorry, the